is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taryn Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. We have ourselves in a jam-packed show for you all, as we have a lot of volleyball to get into, such as the ABP's Denver Open has concluded. Which pairs came out on top on the men's side, and which pairs came out on top on the women's side? Also, we have one schedule release, and it's by popular demand, a.k.a. a request. What schedule release will I be breaking down? And how about Team USA in the BNL? They are the number one seed, but who will they be facing, and who else is joining them in the top eight? And it's the last week of the 2022 NBA regular season, as I'll be previewing event number five, and we have a little special secret surprise in the show. So hand me a volleyball. Set the net. Because I'm about to serve you up some volleyball action here on Set Point. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all those sports. Welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. I hope you all are having a great Monday afternoon, Monday evening, Monday wherever. Happy Independence Day or 4th of July to everybody. I hope you all are enjoying that as well. I know I am because I am off work after working a long and grueling eight hours. But I am here to deliver to you all that delicious volleyball goodness, even on a holiday. Because I am just that dedicated Without any any fourth any further delay, let's get on in to that volleyball goodness. But first and foremost, a word from our sponsor. iSports Radio is proud to call the Southern California Warriors semi pro football team the official sponsor of iSports Radio. The world of semi pro sports is unlike any other sports organization. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed to trap for professional teams, big time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you've been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow them on Twitter, at SoCal Warriors, on Instagram, at Southern California underscore Warriors, and on Facebook by typing in the word Southern, California, and then Warriors. And then I Sports Radio, our our organization slash main platform, is available on Twitter, Instagram, and just newly added on TikTok at IE Sports Radio. And on Facebook by typing in the word IE, then sports, then radio. IE Sports Radio also has a website, www.iesportsradio.com. And when you go there, you will see a Patreon link at the top. And when you click it, it starts at $5 a month. This will get you a shout out on all of our shows, all 27 of our shows, including this one, and higher tiers will include iSports Radio merchandise, access to IESRU, the podcasting university of iSports Radio, even a chance to be featured on a segment of our flagship show, The Defining Moment with Larry B. Because for the past eight years and going on, iSports Radio has been bringing you amazing content ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major sports cities around the country. All the while, we've been continuing to be by the fans and for the fans. With your help, we are ready to take the next biggest step. Thank you to everyone for all of your support and for making iSports Radio your direct feed for all that sports. Big shout out to our four Patreon supporters, Bay Area Raised Apparel, Marcus Los Great, Key to the Gate, and an anonymous supporter. Also, a big shout out to our fan of the month, Justin Ekstrom. His Twitter is at the Sports Crib 21 and he is a Minnesota Vikings fan hailing from the Great Lakes of Minnesota. Also, a big thank you once again to everyone that made iSports Radio's 8th anniversary 
special, super duper special. Here's some more anniversaries to come. And with all that said and done, let's get on into that volleyball action. But first and foremost, we have a schedule release. Yes, we're still doing schedule releases. The NCAA women's volleyball season is getting closer and closer by the day. And we're only going to do one schedule release, and this is kind of by popular demand. As this one, I'm actually dedicating to Mike Pat because he wanted me to do the schedule release for this team. So we're going to do the schedule release for Florida State's women's volleyball team. First and foremost, we have to give a big shout to Larry B., who is in the live chat room. He says, happy 4th, brother. Hey, happy 4th of July to you too, man. I appreciate everything that you do for IE Sports Radio and hope you're enjoying the day just as much as I am. So as for Florida State's schedule... For those of you that remember last year, Florida State had themselves a very promising year despite having a fairly young team. They managed to defeat quite a bit of teams that no one thought they would actually beat. They even beat Florida, which everyone thought Florida was going to get the better of them, but Florida State was just that good, I tell you. So, but this time, Florida State, returning a good chunk of its team from last year, returns to action this year, and here are its scheduled opponents. Starting on, starting out on August 26th, Florida State hits the road to Cincinnati, Ohio, to take on Illinois State. And then on August 27th, Florida State will remain in Cincinnati to take on Dayton. And then on August 28th, they will take on host school Cincinnati. So Dayton already, right off the bat, is an NCAA tournament team. A very darn good NCAA tournament team at that. Cincinnati is kind of underrated. They haven't really had that much success ever since Jordan Thompson was on their team. And then Illinois State is was just invited just because they're Illinois State. So that's that for the first week. Then they'll have their Florida State Invitational. It's a four-day event as August 31st they will host Florida A&M September 1st they will host James Madison September 3rd they'll have a double header with Yale and Austin P Austin P State so that's pretty much that for the Florida State Invitational nothing really stand outish when it comes to those four matches but it's all good then they have a double a two-day event in Omaha, Nebraska as they take on the Omaha or University Nebraska Omaha. Everyone just refers to them as Omaha just because it's Omaha. So they took on Omaha on September 8th and then they take on Creighton on September 9th, which I think that's going to be a great matchup just because it's the battle of two NCAA tournament teams, one making it to the Sweet 16 and one making it to the round of 32. Overall, I think it's going to be a great match, and Creighton returns just as many players as Florida State does. I really think that matchup can go either way. It's the battle of non-Power 5 versus Power 5, and I think it's not going to disappoint. And And then Florida State will hit the road... And I use the word road very loosely as they won't have to travel far as they'll be hitting the road to take on its crosstown rival Florida in Gainesville on September 13th, which I that's the granddaddy of them all when it comes to Florida State's non-conference schedule. Florida State is definitely licking their chops when it comes to that Florida matchup. They're out to prove that that matchup, that win last year, was not a fluke. And Florida's out to prove that they are much better than last year's matchup dictates and it's definitely going to be a barn burner it's always a barn burner when the seminoles and the gators do battle with one another and then to close out the non-conference schedule for florida state they are at home against uab i kind of think that's a little bit of an odd matchup uab of all teams maybe they just needed another match to schedule and they just couldn't find anyone else so i feel that is a decent matchup right there i feel they could have gotten like another team but maybe all the other teams had their schedules filled up already but either way it is what it is for florida state so that's that for their non-conference schedule jumping to their conference schedule right off the bat they've got two formidable opponents at home starting on september 23rd they have notre dame which i think is going to be a great matchup right there i think notre dame is much 
while they did lose quite a bit of players to the transfer portal and they did lose their new head coach, I still think Alana Rock will, will have them heading in the right direction. And I think Notre Dame does have that potential. They have good players like Hattie Monson and Lauren Tarnoff. I really think Notre Dame is going to be out to prove the doubters wrong. And then following that matchup, two days after, September 25th, Florida State will host Louisville, which that's a major jump from facing Notre Dame. Like, the talent level is going to be enormous in terms of the level of jumping when it comes to Notre Dame and Louisville. Louisville did lose quite a bit to graduation, but they're still going to be the powerhouse team that everyone's going to know and fear. Then Florida State hits the road for a two-game road trip in North Carolina. Starting on September 30th, they will play at NC State. NC State has drastically improved as they got quite a good number of transfers from the transfer portal. Then on October 2nd, two days after, Florida State will be playing at North Carolina, which UNC always has a good team. Last year, they won all their non-conference games, and they made the NCAA tournament. So I really think North Carolina could give Florida State a run for its money, but remember, it's a Florida State team that returns quite a bit of talent from last year. Jumping ahead to the next week, Florida State hits the heads back home to take on Miami in the Battle of the Florida Schools, which I think that's always a good interstate rivalry matchup. I like this matchup, and I think... Both these teams are going to be raring to go. Miami had themselves a great season, making it all the way to the Sweet 16. And Florida State is out, once again, to prove that it can go deeper than the round of 32. And I really think that when it comes to Miami, Florida State, all bets are off. Then two days after, October 7th, Florida State will play Duke. Eh, I've never really known for Duke having a decent team. Like, they should be decent because they got a good number of transfers, but they don't have, like, that big talent that some of – that the ACC has. Like, Florida State returns a good chunk of players such as Emma Clothier, Clothier Audrey Koenig, Corey Lewis, Emery Dupes. That's just a few of the names that Florida State returns. Following the Duke matchup, Florida State hits the road to Virginia to take on Virginia in Charlottesville. Once again, Virginia is improved. Like, the mostly ACC is going to be improved from last year, with the slight exception of Pitt, which I think kind of is in the neutral zone of being good and not so good, but I think Pitt is always going to be decent. And speaking of Pitt, Pitt is the next matchup following that Virginia matchup on October 16th as Florida State heads down to Pittsburgh to take on Pitt, which I really think that could also be a big matchup right there. Remember, that Pitt team made it all the way to the Final Four, but they did lose quite a bit of players from last year, such as Lekator member Manet and Kayla Lund, to name a few. So I think Pitt could be still trying to figure it out, but... When, but this will probably be in the middle of ACC play. So I think Pitt will f- pretty much have it figured out for the most part. Then Florida State will head back home to take on Virginia Tech on October 21st and then Wake Forest on October 23rd. Wake Forest has improved. They do have some good talent. However, I think Florida State can handle both of those two teams, especially since it's at in Tallahassee. I really think Florida State is going to be really good on its home court. Then Florida State hits the road for two-game roadie, starting with Syracuse and then ending it with a trip to Chestnut Hill when they take on Boston College. So both of those teams are kind of improved. Both teams, Boston College, I know, lost players to graduation, key players to graduation, I know they lost one player to Wisconsin, and then Syracuse is going to be only return six players, if you all remember last week when I talked about how they just recently hired a new coach, and how they only have six returning players, which I think is going to be a big work in progress for the Orange. 
Florida State then returns home for a two-game homestand against Clemson and Georgia Tech. The Clemson match, I don't think Florida State should have too much trouble with. Now, the Georgia Tech one is a whole other story, as Georgia Tech has the strong arm of Julia Bergman, and they also return players such as Bianca Bertolini. So, for me, I think Florida State could have their hands full against Tech, but honestly, Florida State could possibly hold their own. Hence the word could, though. It's not set in stone. Then Florida State hits the road to South Bend to take on Notre Dame. Again, big-time matchup right there. That could determine who makes the NCAA tournament and who could miss out, especially if both teams could be treading at 500 or worse or better. I really think that Notre Dame last year, when they played Florida State, they came up big, especially when the season was on the line and they needed to win out all of their games in order to finish 500. Notre Dame, to that end, however, did not make the NCAA term because they lost one game too many and they finished under 500. Florida State, on the other hand, they could have Notre Dame figured out, but it's not set in stone. Like, we really have to wonder what Notre Dame is going to do. They did lose, like, a lot of players to graduation, but you also got to remember, they actually have a good recruiting class this year, and they had a good recruiting class last year as well. And obviously under Alana Rockwell, they should be better, but I think Florida State should handle them. But that's a big should. Then Florida State returns home to take on North Carolina on November 18th. By the way, that Notre Dame matchup is on November 11th, and the Clemson-Georgia Tech matches are on November 4th and 6th. So back to North Carolina. Once again, North Carolina is definitely a good team. I definitely think that they have... They have quite a bit of good returning players, such as Mabry Shaftmaster. And she was, I want to say she was like the ACC Freshman of the Year. Not entirely certain, but she did get some sort of ACC honors last year. So either way, North Carolina is going to be good. They always have a good team. And I think this year they're going to be out to prove that they can hang with some of the best in the ACC. And then Florida State closes out its regular season with two challenging matches on the road, starting with a trip to Coral Gables to take on Miami on November 23rd. Then on November 26th, Florida State hits the road to the ATL to take on Georgia Tech. So Miami and Georgia Tech are both two teams that made it all the way to the Sweet 16, with Georgia Tech making it all the way to the Elite Eight. I really think that Georgia Tech is going to be the challenge. That is the one that Florida State is going to have to get over the hump. And same with Miami. I think Miami is going to be just as challenging. But for me, I think Florida State is going to have their hands full with Georgia Tech. And both games being on the road, that's going to be brutal for them, especially that Georgia Tech matchup. Oof. So there is that for Florida State's schedule overall. Florida State doesn't really have too many big-time matchups outside of of their conference schedule. Like, they have the Creighton matchup. They have the Florida matchup. The Florida matchup is always something good, and Creighton is definitely a noteworthy opponent. But other than that, and maybe... And and we also can't forget about Dayton. Dayton also is a good non-Power 5 conference opponent, which makes the NCAA tournament more times than not. But other than Dayton, Creighton, and... Florida State, that's kind of where the buck stops. Like, there's nothing really standash about the non-conference schedule, which I'm not saying it's disappointing, but at the same time, it's not, like, extremely tough because Florida State is still kind of a work in progress, but I still think Florida State has that potential. They really can go deep into the NCAA tournament if they really much want to. I really think that they have that potential. And with all the players that they they return, I think that there is no way that they shouldn't really, you know, miss the NCAA tournament. The only way they miss the NCAA tournament is if everything goes awry, which, heaven forbid, that happens. But once again, Emma Clothier returns to the team as she's going to be a senior this upcoming year, she led the team in kills with 287, which is going to, which is huge right there, huge. 
And then Lauren Burroughs is another player that returns to the team. She actually had a dig. She had 271 digs, which wasn't bad. That was actually good for third on the team. Emery Dupes was the leading dig leader for Florida State, and she had 419 digs. I imagine we're going to see a libero battle between those two players. Heck, maybe Florida State runs two liberos. That's kind of my little spiel right there. Caroline Golden also returns for for Florida State, and she had 246 digs. And then Sydney Conley is another returnee that has 179 kills. And then she also... Actually, no, that was Corey Lewis. Corey Lewis led the team in blocks with 102. Clothier was second with 92. And then third was Sydney Conley, who had 52. But Sydney Conley is a player to watch for. I think she's kind of underrated. And then Koenig is also definitely a player to watch for. She had 262 kills, which was good for second on the team. So this Florida State team, in my opinion, is vastly underrated and I think can get the job done in the ACC. They're going to have to ha- win those battles with Georgia Tech as they're playing Georgia Tech twice, but it's actually not as bad. I don't think their schedule in terms of conference play is that brutal. Yes, they have to play Georgia Tech twice. Yes, they have to play Miami twice. Yes, they have to play North Carolina twice. And yes, they have to play Notre Dame twice. But that's it's better than playing Louisville twice and playing Pitt twice. Like, those two are the teams to be in the ACC. So, for Florida State... I think their schedule is very manageable. They should make the NCAA tournament. I could see them going to the Sweet 16, in my honest opinion. But I'm not going to try to put them on a pedestal too much, just because anything can happen in that span. And I really think that Florida State does need to be careful of the entire ACC. I think the entire ACC is just as improved and just as talented. So that is that for Florida State's schedule reveal. So let's jump on into the AVP's event from this past weekend, as that was the Denver Open. I apologize if I didn't really like blow by blow update you at update you all on Twitter, just because I was working and it was pretty tough to update and work at the same time, especially when it's so busy because of Fourth of July weekend. Anyway, so jumping over to the women's side of things of the Denver Open. So the team Mistrini was able to win the women's side. They basically, Liliana and Larissa was just basically dominant. They, well not dominant, they dominated the final as they defeated Caitlin Leary and Carly Can in the final 21-13, 21-13 to win the final, so I honestly I was very impressed by the Mistrini girls. They did, however, lose along the way as they actually lost to to Chelsea Rice, who actually, believe it or not, I actually personally know. Yes, it's kind of crazy if you ask me. And then they'll and speak and Chelsea Rice's partner Mackenzie Ponnet in the winner's bracket final. It was basically the last match, the last match of the winner's bracket, which if you won, you'd go straight to the semifinals. If you lost, you'd have to go down to the contender's bracket and win your way back. So the Maestrini girls basically cruised their way through the first match, edged their way through the second match as they barely beat, Savvy Simo and Abby Van Winkle, the two UCLA products. And then the McStreeny girls just lost to Chelsea Rice and Mackenzie Ponnet. That didn't deter them as in the contenders bracket, the McStreeny girls defeated they were able The Maestrini girls were able to win their way through the contenders bracket. And they actually, it looks like they actually just had an all or nothing match. They just played Gaffney and Turner and they won that one, which is, I, 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 again, this, this is what happens when I don't really follow along when it comes to the AVP, but 
The Maestrini girls won the contenders bracket final as they defeated Gaffney and Turner. Then they made it all the way to the semifinals where they barely beat Gina Urongo and Julia Scholes in the final. They lost the first set 21-15, won the second set 21-16. I actually did get to see a little bit of it on my break at work. Unfortunately, I couldn't see the final bits of it as the Maestrini girls barely beat Yorongo and Skulls 18-16 in that third set. Remember, they had to deal with the freeze play, which means they had to win via a scoring play or a side-out play. I'm sorry, not a side-out play, a serving play. So they had to win one point, and then they had to win another point via serving. In other words, they had to score when serving, whether it's via a service ace, whether it's via a kill, whether it's via an opponent's error, Either way, they had to basically win on on serving scoring. So that's how the freeze play works. It's a little confusing, but definitely do look up freeze play when it comes to the AVP. So impressive tournament for the Maestrini girls. They lost it sometime down the road in the winner's bracket, which I was very surprised. But then they were able to bounce back and win. I definitely think losing to Savvy – or winning against Savvy Simo and Abby Van Winkle kind of – I won't say tired them out. However, I really think that the two were able to re – were just tired out. And then losing to Ponnet and Rice definitely kind of shook them to the core. Fortunately, they were able to turn the tables and defeat the previous pair, which – which is Turner and Turner and the other girl Gaffney. So overall I think that those two, the Maestrini girls, are just they're just in sync with one another. And the other thing I didn't know about the Maestrini girls, I thought they were sisters, but they are not. They are actually uh how do I put this? spouses they're actually in they're they're together i'm just gonna leave it at that so good job to the mixed girls definitely gotta give a shout out to caitlin leary and carly can as they made it to the final they defeated mackenzie Ponnet and chelsea rice in the final or semi-final 25 23 and 21 16 much like can or much like the Maestrini girls, they actually lost to Julia Yorongo and Skulls in the final match of the winner's bracket as they go and the, as they had to go all the way down to the contender's bracket, but they were able to defeat Sko oh, I'm gonna butcher this girl's name, Skojit and Jurger in the contender's bracket final, twenty one twelve and twenty one sixteen. So overall I really thought I, I really thought the Maestrina girls responded well to adversity, and I feel that they did a great job overall following those two losses. And sometimes all you need is that one loss. And something about the AVP that is great is that you could lose once, but you can't lose twice unless you're in the final, of course, and in the semifinal. Like once you reach the semifinal or final, you can't lose; otherwise, you are gone. As we say a little, Mike Pat in the live chat, he says, good evening, sir. And he says, best volleyball podcast on the internet. I appreciate that. I only wish you were here a little bit earlier because I did break down the Florida State women's volleyball schedule. But it's all good. You can always hear it on the playback. So jumping over to the men's side of things when it comes to the Denver Open. So this one was one... We actually had a new reigning champion as Miles Evans and Annie Benish, the number one seed overall of the tournament, managed to win the Denver Open as they took down Evan Corey and Bill Kalinske in the final. I just want to make sure their name was right so I didn't mess it up. So this one, this this pair was quite unique between Evans and Benish. So. Evans and Bench surprisingly started out. <laughs> Flo- Mike Pat says, "Does it matter? Florida State is running the table." <laughs> that's that's pretty funny, Mike. Florida State does, like I said, Florida State does return a good chunk of its players, but we'll see what happens. 
back to the AVP. So Evans and Besh actually started out its day losing in the second round because they had a bye. They lost to Mewerder and Plummer in the second round as they lost in three sets, 22-20, 21-25, and then – or Bennis and Evans took the second set, 21-15, and then Mewerder and Plummer took the third set, 15-10, which I was very surprised. I was not expecting that, and if you had told me that – Miles Evans and Andy Benish won the tournament, but they lost in the first round. I would have looked at you crazy. But you have to give credit to to the pair of Midwarder and Plummer. I really did not think that they were going to upset him. I really did not think that it was going to happen. Travis Midwarder and John Michael Plummer deserve lots of credit. And John Michael Plummer is not related to Catherine Plummer. Sorry to say, but... I digress. Back to Miles Evans and Andy Benish. So those two had to go all the way down to the contenders bracket where they were able to defeat Paulison Miller 21-17, 21-16. Then they defeated Sutton and Phil Dalhauser 21-13, 21-12. That was another pair I was very surprised to see like lose and Phil, Phil Dalhauser a Phil Dalhauser team losing in not only the first round but then losing in the contenders bracket is very puzzling but you have to give credit to Andy Benish he's one of the top players in the AVP then Miles Evans and Andy Benish defeated the duo of Tucker Tucker and his partner Canole in straight sets as honest, honestly that's not too surprising Andy Bash and Evans were just too much for them and I really thought that they were strong altogether and this is this, you're going to see why how unique this was so after that win over Tucker and Canole winning 23-21 21-19 they defeated Joyner and Burrick 21-11 25-20 Twenty-five, fifteen, and then the contenders bracket final. Andy Bench and Miles Evans defeated. They actually got revenge on Plummer and Mowerter in straight sets, twenty-one, seventeen, twenty-one, sixteen. So that's a good way to earn a little revenge after losing in the first, it, not not in the, in the second round because I forgot Miles Evans and Andy Bench had a bye. So then Evans and Bench took down Lotman and. Partain. I actually don't know what Partain it is off the top of my head. I know there are two Partain brothers, and that is they they are from UCLA. So Miles Partain. So Miles Partain and Paul Lotman were the duo that Andy Bench and Miles Evans defeated. They actually had to win that one in three. Twenty one sixteen, twenty one nineteen went to Lotman and Partain, and then. 15-11 went to Evans and Benish. So Kalinski and Corey had to win their battle as well as they barely took down the duo of Sian, Sian, Sian? Sian Cook and Logan Weber in the semifinals as they as they defeated them 20-22, 21-12, and 18-16 as the final consisted of Corey and Kalinski versus Evans Benish. And the first set, Benish and Evans barely squeaked that first set out. They won it 22-20. And then, for the most part, Kolinsky and Corey were both were, – were actually tied – were actually, no, not tied. They actually had the lead against Evans and Benish. And it looked as if we were going to see a three-set thriller. However, Evans and Benish were able to turn the tables, win the second set 21-17, and win the Denver Open – which was quite impressive on their part. Keep in mind they were the number one overall seed, and then unfortunately they kind of took that tumble in the second round. However, ever since that loss in the second round, Evans and Benish did not drop a only dropped one set throughout the rest of the way. They only dropped one set, and that was in the semifinals to Lotman and Partain. So overall, it was a great little 
turning points. Obviously, losing that first match really hurt them. It really stunned everybody. I don't think anyone had that on their bingo card. Especially, you got to remember this, everybody, that Travis Midwerder and John Michael Plummer were both in the qualifier round as they actually... They actually had to win their way from the opening round, the qualifying round, into the main event. And then they had to win their first matchup against the 17 seed. And then eventually they were they had to take down the top seed overall, which they were able to do so. And for Benish and Evans to even take down a Phil Dalhauser team, it's quite amazing. Now, obviously, Phil Dalhauser has had to shuffle his partner around. He had to switch up, switch it up again. And he had to get a new partner as he has John Sutton as his partner. And I'm pretty sure Phil Dalhauser hasn't really played with Sutton a whole lot. However, Phil Dal, this doesn't take away that Phil Dalhauser is one beast of a player and this isn't going to ruin his legacy. So I think that Phil Dalhauser is going to bounce back from this, but back to Evans and Benish, the fact that they only dropped one set following that loss in the second round really speaks to high volumes of how talented they are. I really think that that one loss really kind of like got them out of their heads and just focused themselves more on the game because I really think sometimes you can learn from a loss and then you can definitely find your way back into the competition because again the avp works as follows you could win once in main bracket play on day one but when it comes to the semifinals or finals you can't lose ever again so or you can't and you also can't lose in the contenders bracket final so for evans and benish they really were resilient and i really think that they meshed well with one another. It's going to take them a little time because they certainly were not perfect. However, I really think that they showed a lot of grit and resiliency. And I think that grit and resiliency is going to come into play sometime down the road. So that is that for the AVP's Denver Open event. We're actually going to take ourselves a quick break when we come back. We have some VNL Women's Volleyball to recap as we are now out of round robin play and into the top eight. And we also have some VNL men's volleyball to go over. And then we also have the NVA to re or to preview as this is the last week of the regular season before the playoffs start. So you are listening to set point here on I sports radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this. What's up, sports fans? Are you looking for the latest on Northern California sports? Then take a trip out west with me, your host, Gina G, on Reppin' the NorCal Sports, right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'll be bringing it to you all the way live every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And it's always a packed show. I'll bring you everything. Dynastic 49ers. The bite of the San Jose Sharks. Torture of the San Francisco Giants. The Golden State Warriors that we still believe. Then take you across the bay to the rise and grind of the Oakland A's. I've got you covered on college ball from the Cal Bears to the Stanford Cardinal, so that no matter what, repping the NorCal sports is always repping the Bay. So if you bleed red and gold, or you're looking to keep an eye out west in them thar hills, don't miss me, Gina G, on repping the NorCal sports. Catch me every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, and I'll have your fandom repped harder than a trio of Defenders Garden Stephen Curry before his buzzer beater is Gucci.
What is going on, everybody? My name is Harrison Glazer, and we're coming at you from the show that never sleeps podcast. I cover the Jets, the Islanders, the Nets, and the Yankees. This is Fia Moss, and I cover the Mets, Knicks, Rangers, and the Giants. Our show is live every Wednesday through Spreaker and a bunch of other ways to get our content. Again, we're the show that never sleeps podcast. We talk about all those New York sports. It's a lot of fun. We get into all of it. Please tune in again. That's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. And we look forward to having you guys right here on Night Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Sports fans, do you like teams that are tough, cities that are tougher, and fan bases that are passionate about their teams? How about teams that are historic and stadiums that are iconic? Then you belong in Chicago, and you need to check out Chi-Town Weekly. Join me, Adam Kernan, every week as we keep up with all things Chicago sports. Bears, Bulls, Blackhawks. Cubs, White Sox, we'll cover them all, plus more. The Windy City is always buzzing, and we'll keep you up on all the big games and major stories. So tune in to Chi-Town Weekly, every week, right here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Segment number two of Set Point here on iSports Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. Definitely do check out all of our amazing shows, such as Rep into NorCal Sports with Gina G. She'll be on tomorrow at 1 p.m. Pacific time. We also have the show that never sleeps with Pierre Moss and Harrison Glazer at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. And then Chi Town Weekly normally goes on at this time, all the way to 6 p.m. Pacific time. 8 p.m. Central Time, but Adam actually had a show earlier because of the 4th of July. Kind of like how I had my show earlier today because of 4th of July. But either way, definitely check out all of our amazing sh- amazing shows. We have lots of shows dedicated to all major sports as well as all major sports cities. Let's get on back into the volleyball action. So I actually kind of forgot one more thing when it came to the AVP. So the AVP actually has Two events this week, and yes, the event was so big that my voice cracked. <laughs> Either way, the AVP has the Waupaca Open on the AVP Tour Series, and then on the AVP Pro Series, we they have the Hermosa Beach Open, which is July 8th through the 10th, while the Waupaca Open is July 8th through the 9th. So... Two AVP events this week. Two. If you're a beach volleyball fan, you're going to love this. And honestly, you can't go wrong with it. And it's going to mean that I've got more volleyball to cover next week. But more on that later. So just need to get, get that tidbit out of the way. Unfortunately, the details, the brackets, and the entry has not been released yet which makes me sad face but it's all good because i can wait it's monday it i don't expect the entry list and the bracket to be finalized just yet actually no the hermosa beach open has been released as the hermosa beach men's side will have casey patterson and phil dalhauser as the top pair 
Triborn and Trevor Crab is the number two pair. Andy Besh and Nick Lucena are the number three pair. And Shame Shulk and Theo Brunner are pair number four. Other pairs I could see that are underrated in my opinion, opinion Evan Corey and Bill Kalinske, Paul Ottman and Miles Partain, Ed Ratledge and Miles Evans, Noah Dyer and Chase Frischman, and I'll give honorable mention to Cody Caldwell and Adam Roberts. Those are all the main draws. Or actually no, they're not all main draws. The the wild card is Jake Diedrich and Hagen Smith, but the qualifiers that have to play on day number one will consist of Ed Ratledge and Miles Evans, Adam Roberts and Cody Caldwell, Noah Dyer and Chase Frischman, and Lev Prima and Sil Salila Tucker. Everyone else is a main draw, and they're already into the main tournament. Jumping on over to the women's side, so the first, the number one seed of the tournament will be Betsy Flint and Kelly Chang, or Kelly Clace, for those of you that know her better than that. And then Sarah Sponsel and Therese Cannon are the number two seed. Kelly Kalinske and Sarah Hughes are the number three seed. Zana Muno and Lauren Fendrick are the four seed. And Larissa Maestrini and Lillian Maestrina, Maestrini are the fifth seed. I'm a little surprised to see the Maestrini girls as the number five seed. I honestly thought with both of those two winning the winning the past two AVP tournaments, I you would think they would be much higher than five. But I guess since a whole lot of these pairs haven't really been playing in the AVP, there is no reason for them to be seated higher just because they haven't been participating in the AVP and they've just been training all over the place, especially when it comes to the pro series outside of the AVP. So overall, that's pretty much your top five seeds. The ones that are the the qualifiers, well, your wild card is, oh my goodness, I'm going to mispronounce her name, Agnes, as Agneska Prigawaska and Heather Friesen are both the wild card pair. As for the qualifiers that have to play on the qualifying day, that consists of Haley Harward and Fallon Fono Fonoe Moana, and then Kendra Kendra Fans Whiten and Kim De, Kim DeCello, then Kimberly Hildreth and Lexi Denneberg, Gina Yarongo and Julia Scholes, Julia Scholes, Aurora Davis and Tegan Van Gust. And finally, we have Allie Wheeler and Deanna, Deanna, Deanna Craft. Everyone else is a main draw participant, and I wish y'all good luck. If if I didn't have to work this weekend, and if I didn't have another event on Saturday, I would maybe go to this event in Hermosa Beach. But Hermosa Beach is a little out of my way, but soon I will be going to a, an AVP event, hopefully sooner rather than later. Hopefully, just hopefully, still crossing my fingers, so we'll see. So that's pretty much your Hermosa Beach main draw participants. Unfortunately, the Walpaca main draw hasn't been released yet, but it's all good. Like, we're probably going to see a different, a new pair, like, win the Walpaca, the Walpaca tournament, while the Hermosa Beach tournament is going to be... It'll probably be like if I had to pick, I'd maybe say <sighs> for the women's side. I think it's it's very much wide open. I really think anyone can win it, even even someone that's not really well known. But I guess maybe Betsy Flint and Kelly Chang. I maybe my second pick would be Kalinsky and Hughes, but you never know. And then for the men's side, it's definitely wide open, just because. A lot of these players are now partnered with their primary partners like Patterson and Dalhauser, Triborn and Trevor Crabb, Lucena and Benish. Like, now that everyone is with their primary partner, they're going to start meshing well together. And honestly, it's going to be something to watch for when it comes to Hermosa Beach. I hope that Hermosa Beach doesn't take the full spotlight away from Walpaca. So, we'll just have to see what happens in the Hermosa Beach one. I'll, all eyes will probably be on Hermosa Beach, but we'll see. Mike Pat says, anyone can win, huh? We'll, we will see about that, LOL. Yes, we will see about that. I mean, 
it's wide open when it comes to any of the pairs. So we'll have to see, wait and see. But that is that for the AVP preview of the Hermosa Beach and Walpaca Open. So let's jump on into some VNL or some World Cup, some volleyball World Cup action. So the VNL round robin play has finally concluded. And after a long, grueling duel to the, I wouldn't say duel to the death, but a duel for the ages, the U.S. is the number one seed as they are 11, they finished 11 and 1 with 32 points. How did the U.S. get there, you ask? Well, starting out on on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, the U.S. swept Belgium 25-16, 25-21, and 25-19. That wasn't the only good news, though. The main good news was when they found out that Japan had lost, which was huge right there because that basically catapulted them into the top spot. And all the U.S. needed to do was win out. And if they did so, then they would be the number one seed. If not, then it would get a little dicey. So, overall, Japan did lose to the Netherlands, which was a huge loss. They lost in five, which I definitely think could have been avoidable. Japan won the first set 25-23. Netherlands won the second set 25-20. Japan won the third set 26-24. The Netherlands won the fourth set 25-21. And the Netherlands won the fifth set 15-10, which I thought was huge. And then the day after, Japan lost to Turkey 25-20, 25-15, 18-25, 25-22. And it only got worse for Japan because they wound up losing to Serbia as well. They lost at 25-22-25, 25-20, 25-19, and 25-22. So what was looking like Japan, the 8-0 team that was pretty much a lock for being the number one seed, they wound up crashing and burning. They lost three in a row that week. Now, I don't know if they weren't at full strength or maybe they were just resting players when they shouldn't have, but it was rather alarming to see that great team that was just basically up on its highest of highs go all the way down. The Turkey loss for Japan is not that surprising, just because I said last week that Turkey does have some stud players, and I would not be surprised if Turkey had that talented, the talented players that they had from the Olympic team from 2021. So I'm not surprised Turkey really came. For me, Turkey really came alive in this tournament this past week. And you're about to see why, as back to the U.S., jumping back to the U.S., they actually defeated Serbia in straight sets as well, 25-17, 33-31, and 25-16. That second set could have gone either way, but the U.S. was able to grind it out, which was very incredible. So the U.S. got closer and closer, as they also had to take on Turkey, which they had themselves a barn burner against. They, the U.S. won the first set 25 22 Turkey won the second set, 25-18. Then the U.S. dodged two set points as they wound up winning the third set, 27-25. Turkey won the fourth set, 25-23. Then in the fifth set, Turkey led most of the way. They were up 12-9, and they could taste the victory. But then the U.S. got some good contributions from Kelsey Robinson, and then they also got some key serving from Annie Drews, who I thought was – who I think is probably the best server on the team, in my honest opinion. And eventually the U.S. was able to win the fifth set, 18-16, as they got closer and closer to locking up the number one seed. And then yesterday they defeated Germany 25-17, 25-13, 13-25, 20, and 25-22 to lock up the number one seed – which was huge right there. So your top eight is as follows. USA is number one. Brazil is number two. They actually, believe it or not, they actually tied with Italy for second place as Italy and Brazil finished with, fin- they both finished 10 and two. They both finished with 29 points, but the big tiebreaker went to sets won and lost as Italy lost one more set than Brazil as Brazil 
is now the number two seed, and Italy is the number three seed. China will be the number four seed as they went eight and four, as well as Japan and Serbia for that matter. The only difference was is that China had 26 points, Japan had 25 points, and Serbia had 23 points. Turkey finished seven and five. They also finished with 23 points. However, that seven and five record kind of comes back to haunt them. And then lastly, Thailand finished five and seven with 15 points. They actually tied with the Dominican Republic at 5-7, and seven, but because Dominican Republic had 14 points compared to Thailand's 15, Thailand had the upper hand when it came to that category. So the quarterfinal knockout round is as follows. USA versus Thailand, Brazil versus Turkey, Italy versus Serbia, and China versus Japan. Honestly, Brazil versus Turkey is probably the most exciting. Now, 2 versus 7 is obviously one-sided with the 2 the two basically being the heavy favorite. But with how Turkey played this past weekend, defeating Japan and nearly knocking off the U.S., I really think Turkey could, hence the word could, defeat Brazil. I'm not saying they will. I'm saying that Brazil needs to be careful. Like, they lost twice, but with them being led by Julia Bergman, I don't think Brazil is going to be losing anytime soon. The other intriguing matchup is China versus Japan. Now, obviously, Japan had themselves a rough ending to the VNL. How... Wait. Wait. Why am I seeing Brazil versus Japan? Uh, according to Google, Brazil it's going to be Brazil versus Japan. So I guess they're not doing it. They're not going to have the one versus eight. Okay. So I get... I, Guess I'm wrong. So, U.S. plays Serbia. I guess I should listen to Google. So, U.S. plays Serbia. Brazil plays Japan. Italy will play China. And then Thailand will play Turkey. So, that's that's interesting. Like, it's norm- normally it would be 1 versus 7. And 1 versus 7, 2 versus... Or 1 versus 8, 2 versus 7... Three versus six and four versus five, but I guess the VNL does something very different. But okay, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> so ap- apologies for that, but that is very surprising. I did not know that. See, this is this is kind of new new to me. This is new when it comes to the VNL. So overall, I think no matter what the circumstance is, I think anyone can beat anybody. So. Backtracking here, Brazil and Japan is going to be a great matchup right there. I really think Brazil-Japan is going to be something to watch for, and I feel that that it could go either way. It's going to be Japan, which was the scrappy, really good team all the way up to last week, taking on the perennially good Brazil team, which always has a lot of good Which always has a good team. And with Julia Bergman on their team, I really think that Brazil is just going to be something talented to watch for. And then Italy, China is also going to be big time as well. I really think that that Italy, China is going to be, is going to have some fireworks. And I really think that both of those teams, both those teams are just going to give it their all. Because Italy, I feel, is vastly underrated and then China as well. China actually was once the top team. They were actually I want to say they had won gold at one point. However, they kind of had a little bit of a fall. They kind of fell off, but then but now they're kind of back. So, for China, this is kind of their opportunity to make a statement, but Italy is going to be so tough. So, basically, Brazil Japan and Italy, China are your matches to watch for. Also, keep an eye out on Turkey. I'm honestly certain Turkey will win its first round quarterfinal matchup. So, I said that the U.S. was going to play an opponent that it was supposed to play that on Twitter yesterday. So, that was my fault. I'm sorry, everybody. I did not know. I, I didn't know the VNL does something very differently. So... 
So my apologies to everyone. I did not know that. Um, it's still – the whole VNL is still very much new to me. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens going forward. So there's that. So that is that for the VNL on the women's side, and I'm really excited for the knockout round. The gameplay starts on the 13th, which I really think is going to be quite exciting, and I really think it's going to be something to watch for, and I can't wait for it. I really think that – I think any of those teams between the U.S., Japan, China, Italy – Brazil and Turkey can win it. I'm not saying that Serbia and Thailand aren't going to win it, but I'm saying that those six teams that I just mentioned in the former, I think those teams are basically going to beat up on one another. And I really think that one of those teams is going to, I would not be surprised if there was like an upset in the quarterfinals. I would not be surprised if a team that had high expectations would somehow lose in the quarterfinals. Mike Pat says, I always come away from the show feeling smarter. I may not remember the information, but this is one of the shows I learned so much about. Thank you, Mike. I really do appreciate it. And just as I could say double for your show, Let's Wine About DMV Sports. Mike talks about all kinds of wines. So definitely do check that out on iSports Radio. Jumping to the men's side of things of the VNL. So the men's VNL standings are as follows. So France and Poland are both tied atop the standings at 7-1, and one, both with 21 points. France has the tiebreaker in terms of sets lost with, only, with having only lost five as opposed to Poland six. Italy and Japan, as well as the U.S., are all 6-2. and two. Only difference is Italy has 19 points, Japan has 18 points, and the U.S. has 17 points. Brazil and Netherlands are both 5-3. and three. Brazil has 15 points. Netherlands has 14 points. And Iran and Serbia are both fighting for that 8 spot. They are both 4-4. Four and four. Iran has 12 points. Serbia has 11 points. And then everyone else, uh, and the ones that are hopeful are Slovenia and Germany, both at 3-5. and five. And Slovenia, 9 points. And Germany, 7. So that's kind of your hopefuls and pretty much on – the lookout for clinching a spot in the top eight. Jumping over to the U.S. So the U.S. had themselves a rough week, not last week, but the week before, where they went two and two. John Sparrow says there were some good things that happened, and then there were some things that they need to work on. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So this week, German or the U.S. plays Germany, which, like I said, Germany is kind of a hopeful to make to make the top eight. A win would definitely help Germany's odds of winning the, or making it to the top eight. But the U S knows that they can't afford any slip ups. They can't afford another loss. Otherwise they could see themselves get further and further back of the top eight. That's actually being played today at 11 PM Pacific time. Woof. Ouch. And then on Wednesday, the U.S. will play France, which, oh, that's that's going to be their tough matchup. That's a huge jump in terms of level of talent as, like I said, France is the number one team. And boy, howdy, that's going to be – that's going to be a handful for the U.S. Then on Friday, the U.S. plays Canada, which Canada is 14th. They are 2-6. and six. The U.S. should be able to handle that. And then lastly, the U.S. closes out – Round robin play against Argentina on Saturday. Argentina is twelfth in the standings. They are two and six. They're basically, uh, they're basically a long shot to getting into the top eight. I'm not trying to say that in a mean way, but I'm saying that in the most truthful and respectful way. So for the U.S., they still have a chance to be the the number one seed. However. They're basically going to need to run the table, and they may need to get some help along the way. I could still see them making the top eight. I do not see the U.S. losing to Canada or Argentina. And I don't really see them losing to Germany. I said last week or a couple weeks ago that the U.S. will definitely have a tough time against France. But other than that, their other three matchups against Germany, Canada, and Argentina are definitely favorable toward them. The only way they don't make the top eight is if they 
just mess up entirely, and Spira shuffles his lineup to the point where they can't, you know, mesh well with one another. And then also you got to... And then the another way that the U.S. don't doesn't make the top eight is if they miss a bunch of serves because John Spira teams love to miss a lot of serves at UCLA, but I digress. So for the U.S., it's basically time to strike while the iron is hot. So we'll see what happens, but that is that for the men's side of thing of the VNL. Actually, we'll look at France's schedule. France opens up play against the U.S. Then they have Brazil, Argentina, and Australia. So France pretty much controls its own destiny. U.S., Brazil, Argentina, and Australia means that they're – I would say they're getting progressively easy. But the U.S. is fifth, Brazil is sixth, Argentina is twelfth, and then Australia is sixteenth. It's basically going to be easy sledding as the week goes on. So as for Poland, they have Iran, which for them, for Iran, they are actually eighth, which they are hopeful to make the top eight. And then Poland has China, which China is 13th, not that impressive. Then Poland has the Netherlands, which is 7th, which is another top 8 hopeful. Top 8 most likely, in my opinion. And then Poland closes out against Slovenia, which is a top 8 outsider, which it could happen. Slovenia is 10th, but they're going to need a lot of good to happen if they want to make the top 8. So for Poland, they also are in control of their destiny. They don't really have a whole lot of opponents that are in like the top five. So if Poland gets help from the teams that France plays, it could probably jump to being number one, but you also got to make note that France also does have easy sledding following the U S matchup, U S and Brazil matchup. So if France does get past the U S and Brazil, they're pretty much a lock for the top eight if not the top seed overall. So there's no, the only way France or Poland doesn't make the, doesn't clinch the number one seed is if they both lose along the way or they lose twice along the way. And then the U S or any of the third or fourth place teams get hot and they eventually overtake France and Poland. I mean, Italy and Japan are still hopefuls of making the top two, and then the U.S. also is a hopeful as well. It's just that the U.S. just cannot afford any mistakes. So that is that for the VNL on the men's side. Like I said, play gets going today and tomorrow. And it's sure to be exciting. And I look forward to seeing what the men have to offer. So that's that officially for the VNL men's side of things. Now let's jump on in to the NVA. And oh baby, last week of the regular season is here and it's sure to be a a regular season finale to remember as we're getting down to the nitty gritty of it. So this is basically for playoffs. Playoffs? Playoffs? Are you kidding me? Playoffs? <laughs> Either way, Jumping to July 8th, we have the Texas Tyrants versus the Chicago Untouchables. So looking at the standings right now, Texas is pretty much is pretty much locked up its division. There's no way they can lose the National Central Division. They're in the playoffs, but they have other big goals to claim, and that would be to win the or to be the number one seed from the National Conference. However, you also have to remember that another hopeful is the New Jersey Freedom. And honestly, it's doable for the Tyrants to win out and become the number one seed. But also have to remember that the Freedom have the tiebreaker over the Tyrants. So we'll see what happens when it comes to that matchup. I, it's certainly going to be in favor of Texas. No offense to the Untouchables, but the Untouchables' playoff playoff chances are on life support. 
in order for Chicago to make the playoffs is they have to win out and then they have to get help from pretty much everybody else. And they have to make sure that the Los Angeles Blaze don't win a match. And if it comes down to that, then the Blaze and the Untouchables will play a one-match playoff to determine who makes the playoffs this upcoming year. That first matchup is on July 8th at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Then at the 12 p.m. Pacific Time slot, we have the Utah Stingers and the Dallas Tornadoes. I mentioned this earlier in the season that Week 5, or event number 5, is basically going to be facing the teams in your division. Kind of like how the NFL does when all the teams play its division rivals in Week 17-18. slash Well, Week 18 now, but I digress. So, for the Utah Stingers and the Dallas Tornadoes, the Tornadoes and Stingers are basically still hopeful of winning its division. The Tornadoes had themselves a rough weekend, while the Stingers also kind of let one slip through their fingers. The Stingers are very close to clinching a playoff spot, but you cannot count out the Dallas Tornadoes. The Dallas Tornadoes are just too are, are have have drastically improved, and with Felix, the strong arm of Felix Chapman, all the Utah Stingers can do is hope for the best and hope that. Felix Chapman does not go off. If he doesn't, then Utah should have this one in the bag. And something to note is that the Stingers can win its division with a win over the Tornadoes if they do so. That's how the Utah Stingers can win their division. A win over the over Dallas clinches the division. If they lose, then the Tornadoes and the Stingers basically are tied for at four and four, or I'm sorry, not four and four, a uh, four and five, going into the last match of the weekend, and then that's when we got to consider points. And we'll look at points in a little bit, but for right now, let's continue on with the other matchups. So this is probably the granddaddy matchup of them all: Orange County Stunners taking on the New Jersey Freedom. That is really going to be a great matchup. The Orange County Stunners and New Jersey Freedom have both punched their ticket into the playoffs. However, the Freedom have not won- have not clinched the division. The only way the Stunners can win the division is if they run the table. If they win out and then the New Jersey Freedom lose out, then the Stunners have a shot at winning the division. But the... F- t- the New Jersey Freedom has just been so good this year. Like they are eight and zero, the best team in the NVA, and they're the only team remaining in the NVA that's undefeated. And it's really incredible, honestly. The Stunners, being the reigning NVA champions, they're still pretty much good. And like I said, they've clinched a spot in the playoffs, but they do know they want to improve its playoff positioning, especially if they don't want to face the Texas Tyrants in the first round. Either way, I really think that the Stunners are still not going to be a team that no one wants to play come playoff time. So for the Stunners against or against the New Jersey Freedom, it could go either way with this matchup. I really think that the Freedom and the Stunners could go the distance. The first matchup saw the Freedom defeat the Stunners in four sets, and honestly, the Jersey grit is real when it came to New Jersey. So I really think the Freedom can really show their stuff against the Stunners. But the Stunners are definitely improved. Matt Hilling has done a great job with the team. Joey Jarvis has also done a great job as well. So I really think that the Stunners can do well, especially since they have strong middles as well. And then closing out the day of July 8th, we have the Las Vegas Ramblers taking on the Inland Empire Matadors. So... The Ramblers are pretty much the number one seed. That's a guarantee. They have seven wins and one loss. And honestly, I would not be surprised if they pretty much ran the table and won the American Conference in the playoffs. Now, the Inland Empire Matadors, they are one of three teams that is three and five. And they are hopeful of getting the wild card because they're certainly not going to catch up to the Las Vegas Ramblers. In order for the Matadors to pretty much ensure themselves a spot in the playoffs, they pretty much have to win out, which could be tricky just because, well, 
beating the Ramblers is not going to be any easy feat. The Ramblers have only lost one match all season. The Matadors, on the other hand, they haven't really been consistent as of recent. Well, as of recent, they've been consistent. But in the past, this season, they haven't really had that level of consistency, which is not something you want to see. But I think the Matadors are starting to play better volleyball. Eric or not, yeah, Eric Beatty has done a great job as he I think he's one of the NVA newcomers and I really think the Eric Beatty has done an outstanding job and I think he's going to continue to do great things for for the the Inland Empire Matadors. So overall, I really think that the Matadors they kind of have a shot especially if the Ramblers start to rest players because they can't go any worse than one. That's a get well, well-known fact that they can't go any worse than number 1 when it comes to when it comes to their seeding. Like they have basically they locked up the number 1 seed in the national conference and honestly, I think they the sky's the limit for that team and I really think that that the Ramblers are out to prove everyone that last year was unfortunately just a slip up on their part in the final. So we'll see what happens going forward when it comes to them. But overall, I think that they have a good shot. I wouldn't say that they're a lock for the final, but you never know with the Ramblers. The Ramblers have a lot of firepower. Jordan Hoppy has just been amazing. I'm blanking on the other guy's name. Uh, I'm actually I'm actually blanking on the other outside hitter's name, but overall, the Ramblers are just so there. There, there's not a whole lot of weakness to them, and I really think that that there's no slowing down the Ramblers, especially in that conference. So Brandon Rattray, that's his name. Brandon Rattray was is the other outside hitter for the Las Vegas Ramblers. And he does a great job as well. So I think Rattray definitely takes some of the pressure off of Hoppy. My thing is, is that I don't think Hoppy is going to be rusty anytime soon. I think Jordan Hoppy is going to be fresh coming off of playing in the AVP. Because... This past weekend, he also played in the Denver Open, and honestly, I I would not be surprised if Jordan Hoppy came out swinging. And he actually missed last week, despite the Ramblers winning both games. He actually missed the previous event as he had to coach for Balboa Bay Volleyball Club. But I digress on that, so... That's basically Ramblers versus Matadors in a nutshell right there. And that's pretty much that for the July 8th matches. July 9th, we will have the Los Angeles Blaze taking on the Texas Tyrants. So all the Blaze need to do in order to make the playoffs is win one match. If they win one match, or if Seattle and Chicago lose one match along the way, they're in. So for the Blaze, they're taking on the Texas Tyrants. I don't expect the Tyrants to rest any of their guys. Yes, it would be quite something to see. It wouldn't be too bad for them as the Tyrants definitely... They're, they've come in quite beaten up, honestly. I really think that the Tyrants are still looking their wounds. They don't. They did not have Gianluca Grasso, and they didn't have a, a few other key key players as well. They just got back their libero, Jose Malero, but overall, I think Texas, they know the magnitude, and they know a win could possibly, hence the word possibly, get them into the number one seed, or at least close to that. We'll see what happens, but I really think Texas should be able to handle the Blaze. The Blaze definitely are in control of their playoff destiny. If like I said, if they pretty much win, or if Seattle and Chicago lose along the way, lost it, the Blaze are in. Now the Blaze cannot get any better than the four, the second wild card spot. They would be seated fourth in the American Conference. That's as best as they can get. They can't get any better than fourth. 
Mike Hat says, would them winning about be a stunner? Ugh. He's talking about the Orange County Stunners possibly defeating the New Jersey Freedom. <laughs> Very funny, Matt. F- Very funny, Mike. Well played. So that's that for the matchup between the Blaze and the Tyrants. Jumping on over to the noon p.m. Pacific time slot, we have the Colorado Kraken taking on the Utah Stingers. Once again, this is another big-time matchup, which could see the Utah Stingers clinching the division, their own division, the American Central Division, I want to say. No, the American... Yeah, yeah, the American Central Division. I was right. <laughs> I'm proud of myself. So the Kraken, in order for them to win the American Central Division, they have to run the table, and then the Utah Stingers have to lose out. <laughs> that's as that's kind of as close as the Kraken will get to winning their division. The only w- another way the Kraken can make the playoffs is, is if the Kraken run the table and then the Tornadoes lose out. And then the Matadors lose out, and then Southern Exposure. Well, it, well, if Southern Exposure plays the Matadors and then they win, then they would get in, and vice versa. Either way, the as long as Southern Exposure or the Matadors don't like go one and one, the Kraken should be, the Kraken should be just fine. So the Kraken overall they have to win out. They have to win out, otherwise their division title hopes and their playoff hopes take a gigantic hit. Like, the Kraken are already walking on thin ice when it comes to their playoff hopes. Like, again, the Kraken have to run the table if they want to make the playoffs. It all starts with this matchup against the Stingers. Utah is definitely going to be a tough customer just because Utah has some good stud players on their team. But so does Colorado, and overall, I think that this matchup could go either way. Like I said, the American Central Division has just been up for grabs for the most part. And I think it's definitely going to boil down to this week. Whoever wins basically whoever wins basically, could be the division champion. Whoever goes 2-0 basically is guaranteed a spot in the playoffs. Jumping on over to the 3 p.m. Pacific time slot game, we have the Seattle Sasquatch versus the Orange County Stunners. The Seattle Sasquatch are basically in the same boat as the Chicago Untouchables. They Their playoff hopes are on life support. They have to run the table, otherwise they're missing the playoffs. It's going to be very tough for Seattle to win this one, especially since Seattle is not has not been good. They have not been good. I'm sorry to say, but... The Sasquatch have just not been good. It's sad, but it is kind of the truth. So overall, for the Sasquatch, they basically have to start running the table, and they have to, hence the word, have to get that big win. They only have one win on the season, and thankfully they're not going to be undefeated, or not undefeated, winless, but they just have a tall task with facing not only the Stunners, on that July 9th, but the day after when they play the New Jersey Freedom. More on that later. Closing out the July 9th matches, we have Southern Exposure versus the Las Vegas Ramblers. Now, Southern Exposure. Southern Exposure currently is the number three team in the American Conference. They have the first wild card spot as they are three and five ahead of the Tornadoes and Matadors in terms of the other three and five teams. So for Southern Exposure to make the playoffs, they just have to win one match against the Matadors. If not, the, if not winning against the Ramblers would be a huge win as well. Something about the Southern Exposure that really has me thinking is that this team nearly beat the Ramblers the first time. They went up 2 nothing in the match. Ramblers won the next two sets. Then the fifth set, they lost off of a overturned call which was actually ruled point to the ramblers then it was overturned to southern exposure and then it, that was overturned to the ramblers so yeah southern exposure just hasn't been the same dominant team it was last year but this is kind of their chance to strike while 
they have a golden opportunity. I really think Southern Exposure has a good shot at making the playoffs. It's just all about them just playing to a T. They have to play to their level, and they can't afford to play below their competition, especially since this is the final week of the season, and everyone is jostling for playoff positioning, including the teams that have pretty much won their division. So overall, I think Southern Exposure and Las Vegas Rambles could be a barn burner. I think that is probably the match of the day right there. I really think that can basically make or break the Southern Exposure's chances of making the playoffs. Jumping to the July 10th matches, we have New Jersey Freedom versus the Seattle Sasquatch. Depending on what happens with the Orange County Stunners matchup, we could see the New Jersey Freedom resting their guys. Well, actually, no. No, 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 no. They're not going to rest their guys. Just because if they're 9-0 and and then Texas is 9-1, and then they would have to win that matchup against Seattle in case, in case the point system does not go in their favor. But more on that later. I definitely see New Jersey beating the Sasquatch. I don't really see them losing. The only way... But here's one thing that you need to watch out for. So, the most dangerous team in the NBA is a team that's not playing for a whole lot. Seattle, if they somehow lose to Orange County, they would basically be eliminated, but they would just play for pride, and they could play spoiler. However... I definitely think the strong arm of Joe Norman and all those other middle blockers and other pin hitters are definitely going to be super strong for the New Jersey Freedom. So we'll see what happens going forward. Then on July 10th at noon Pacific time, we have the Ontario Matadors versus Southern Exposure. This right here, this right here is probably the matchup of the day. Why? Because these two are the teams that are vying for the last playoff spot. There are no ties in volleyball, so for Southern Exposure and the Inland Empire Matadors, whichever team loses, because I could see both those teams losing to Las Vegas, whichever team loses between Southern Exposure and Inland Empire Matadors, you're gone. The team that wins is going to the playoffs. The other team is probably going to go bye-bye. I really think that's going to be your matchup of the day right there. It's basically for the final wild card spot. It's basically like Chargers versus Rams in Week 18, or not Chargers versus Rams, uh, Chargers versus Raiders in Week 18 of the previous NFL season. But I digress. Going to the 3 p.m. slot time, we have Colorado Kraken versus Dallas Tornadoes. This is another matchup that could make or break any playoff teams playoff chances for the tornadoes if they somehow lose out like if they somehow lose to the stingers which is possible and then they somehow lose to the kraken that could leave the door open for colorado to make the playoffs if for some odd reason colorado didn't win prior if colorado like i said wins out then they're pretty much a lock for making the playoffs for dallas I don't see them. I don't really see them losing this matchup as long as Felix Chapman is just healthy and he's doing his thing. I really think that the Tornadoes can do anything to any team. I really think that as Felix Chapman can take Dallas as far as Dallas wants to go. So for the Tornadoes, they. I don't think they should rely heavily on Felix Chapman. They have to have other players like banking that they should bank on, but we'll see. And then closing out the NBA season in terms of the regular season, we have the Chicago Untouchables versus the Los Angeles Blaze. Kind of the most anticlimactic match. I personally would like to rearrange the Southern Exposure versus Ontario Matadors matchup to being the 6 p.m time slot game <laughs> kind of like how we the nfl likes to flex week it's final week of the matchups for the sunday night football game either way either way the untouchables and blaze is very anticlimactic especially since the untouchables would have to win out 
the Blaze would have to lose out in order for the, sh- for the Untouchables to have a shot at winning or and making the playoffs. Only then will the Untouchables make the playoffs. But if for some odd reason the Untouchables lose along the way, and then Seattle loses along the way, the Blaze are in, Seattle's out, and Chicago's out. But either way, I see the Blaze winning this matchup. So... I really wish this wasn't the final match of the day. I really thought that we would get a better end to the season, or a better end to the regular season, but beggars can't be choosers. This is the NFL, this is the NBA, this is how the matchups are supposed to be. So that is that for your preview of the NBA matches for event number five. There's actually going to be one more match following this following the Chicago Untouchables versus the Los Angeles Blaze matchup, and that is actually going to be the NBA All-Star game. So everyone is having their chances of voting for the NBA All-Stars on Instagram, and everyone is basically is voting for your coaches, or not coaches, the players. The coaches have already been selected, which they've been finalized already. I do not have the All-Star lineup, which is unfortunate. I wish we could have the NBA All-Stars already finalized but it is what it is so yeah the nba is getting bigger and bigger the only way it gets even more bigger is if they have a skills competition like maybe they have a serving competition where if you hit your target then you basically you basically get points kind of like kind of like a three-point shootout or something along those lines either way the only way the nba gets bigger is if they just have like an NVA All Star Weekend, and maybe they have like a women's competition or something like that. I don't know. Either way, the NVA is starting to grow, and it's growing really big. So that is going to do it for the NVA discussion. Before we head on out, I have to, have to, have to give. I have to basically tell everyone my special little, my special super secret surprise that I have been teasing on Twitter. (laughs) So the special super secret surprise that I mentioned last week is basically, here it is, the moment you all have been waiting for. Ever since I tweeted this out on, I want to say it was last week, I think it was like last Wednesday? Yeah, it was last Wednesday. I basically have I have kept this waiting in the wings, but I have definitely I definitely have to pop open the secret. So the super special secret surprise is next week obviously is my 150th show. As you all know, you all could count that this this is episode 149. Next week is going to be episode 150. I don't know if 150s are that special, but I kind of think it's special. However, that's not the super special secret surprise. The super special secret surprise is next week we will be having a guest. We will be having Nick England of the NVA as a guest. As Nick England is a huge deal. He is one of the co-commentators with Ira Thor when it comes to commentating the NBA matches. And he is also a former NBA player. And also, he is the broadcast and director of marketing for the NBA as well. So, Nick England is going to be my guest next week on Set Point. I have been waiting for so long for this to happen. I definitely reached out to him, and he's like, I definitely love to be on as a guest. And I am super excited to have Nick England on as a guest, and I really can't wait to talk with Nick England next week, not only about this past event, but about Nick England in general, and about the NBA and how it's growing. Like, it's freaking growing and soon it's going to be big and it's going to probably be mainstream possibly we'll see but ladies and gentlemen that is going to do it for set point is that time for us to drop that boot as i'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate but before we go in case in case i don't In case I have to run over and I have to basically, unless I talk 
fully with Nick England about the NVA and whatnot. We may have to skip the AVP and the VNL, but time will tell. Now it's time to drop the beat, because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in to Set Point. I really do appreciate you all tuning in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen in the wee hours of the morning, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I definitely appreciate you. Happy 4th of July to everybody. And big shout out to Larry B and my Pat in the chat room. My Pat stayed for the whole show in the live chat room. I really do appreciate you guys for tuning in. I'm sorry you accidentally missed the Florida State segment, but hey, go Colts. For everyone here at iSports Radio, this is Taron Rodriguez signing off. You all have yourselves a great 4th of July as of this point. Be safe. Remember, it is sunburn season. Wear your sunscreen, and if you are already sunburned, apply your aloe vera. Be a good person. Just be kind to one another. Be a good citizen. Be be a good person. That's all I'm trying to say. I will see you on Friday for the two-year anniversary of the SoCal Supreme Court Show. Until then, that point will bring us to you live next week at regular time, 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern, with Nick England. Have a great rest of the evening, everybody. I'll see you Friday. Peace!